I sure appreciate everybody coming out tonight. I know we don't have a full house, but you still come out and you knew our pastor wasn't going to be here tonight. I believe a member of a church has nothing to do with a name on a roll. I really don't. A member of a body, a local body, rejoices with that body, supports that body, and also suffers with that body. So I appreciate it. It shows character. And I know a lot of folks can't make it tonight. A lot of folks have to work busy, busy. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. Anyway, like Brother Van said, please continue to pray for Pastor. Uh, I love my pastor. I love him. He's just a man. And a lot of people try to lift him up and make him something he's not. He's still Charles Lawson. And y'all know all about that Charles Lawson before he got saved. And I just hate for the Lord to let him pastor this church as Charles Lawson. You don't want that to happen. So when people start lifting him up, okay, just, just remind them it's the God he serves that has given him what he's got. And I love my pastor. Pray for his protection and his safety. And he needs this vacation. The pastor, you don't think about it. I mean, he's got to get, this was tough for me. I had to get two messages together today. I preach on the radio and preach here. I about died for a week. <laughs> it's not easy. I've only preached about 20 times. I'm, you know, and I, this man gets, gets, it's Wednesday evening, Sunday school, Sunday morning message and Sunday evening message. And he still has to do visitation. He still makes phone calls. He still answers emails. He still has to pray. He still has to spend time with his family. The man needs a vacation. <laughs> And I, I pray God blesses him and gives him rest just like he, he let Moses, God let Moses, remember that, he let Moses come into the holiest of holies and take him a big, long two-day nap because he was tired. He made a special, a special way for Moses there. God let Moses go in there and rest. I hope he lets Pastor rest just a little bit. <clears throat> if you would, turn your, turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. I'm not going to keep you long tonight. I'm going to be preaching a message on, on someone who's very familiar in the scripture. You might have heard of him. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord told me, you've preached about 20 messages, and you've never preached on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought about that. I've mentioned him, and I've preached, but I've never preached a message on the Lord Jesus. And it, it broke my heart. I want to glorify him. And I want to say something that will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. I want to be a blessing to you. I'm not going to keep you long. It's going to be a short message unless the Lord decides to intervene and extend it. He's always welcome to do that. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses, verse, starting at verse number 13, the infallible text says, When Jesus came in to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say, that I, the Son of Man, am? That's a loaded question right there. And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. They were thinking maybe he was John the Baptist, came back from the dead. He'd been beheaded. Some, Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Some, some thought he might have come back from the dead to deliver Israel. Or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, bar meaning son of, Simon son of Jodah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. No man knows the Father but the Son, no man knows the Son but the Father, and to whomsoever he shall reveal him. Pray with me, if you will. Ask God's blessing on his message. Lord, you know my heart tonight. I pray that you help me preach your word. I'm just a messenger. I'm nothing. I pray that you help somebody tonight. Lead and guide me. Please don't let me say anything that doesn't glorify you. Please don't let me say anything that's in the flesh, God. I just, I just pray you be glorified here tonight and lift your son up. I thank you for this church, and I thank you for the liberty that's in this church. So we can just open your book and preach out of it and listen to Christians come together, and we're safe.
feel comfortable in here. We thank you for that. We don't take it for granted. Please bless tonight. Please move through this place. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> but whom say ye that I am? There are many, many ideas throughout this lost world on who Jesus Christ was and is. Some say that he never existed. Now you can go ahead and throw that out. There's been thousands and thousands and thousands of songs written by one man. Thousands and thousands and thousands of books written by one man. You just throw these guys out. There's some that say he's just a guru. He's just a good person going about doing good works, teaching people how to live right. No, no, that's not it. Some say he's one of the many prophets or spiritual leaders of God. One of many ways to God. He's just like Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius. Puts them on the same level. There's an early belief in the early days of Christianity. It's called doceticism. And what doceticism was, it's, it's exactly what these people right here are thinking. Doceticism was that Jesus Christ received the Holy Spirit. He became the Christ when he was baptized. And when he got on the cross, he lost the Holy Spirit. He lost his divinity. Then he just became a man. He said, my God, my God, why is that? That's a, that's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. Amen. Jesus Christ was the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Some say that he was a, a, just a lying madman. Now listen, with the help of God this evening, I want to clear up a few misconceptions as, a, as to who this man is. I don't want to leave any room for any misunderstandings. Before I attempt that, before I attempt to tell you what religion says he is, I want to do one thing. I want to give you my opinion, but it doesn't really matter what I think. My opinion about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I say that, my opinion doesn't matter if it contradicts what this book says. I'm going to tell you what I believe about him. First of all, he's my everything. He's my everything. He's my life. The Lord Jesus Christ is my breath. He's my heartbeat. He's the one that got me up this morning. He's the one that brought me to church safely. He's the one that keeps me alive. He's the one that keeps my heart beating. He's the one that's keeping our pastor's heart beating. You say, no, that's a battery in his pacemaker. That battery is held together by the word of his power, the Bible says. All things are held together by the word of his power. God's keeping him going. He's cre the Lord Jesus Christ spoke this universe into existence. He keeps... He keeps the moon going around the earth. He keeps the stars shining. He keeps everything together. He keeps it going. He keeps my body moving. He, he's up there with me. If it weren't for him right now, I'd fall down in a heartbeat. He is my everything. He gave me a family. And I bless his holy name. He gave me, if it wasn't for my family, I don't know where I'd be tonight. Now, I wouldn't think about this. Can you please turn to the book of Mark, speaking of families? Please turn to Mark chapter 5. I love my family so much. He gave me two beautiful boys and a beautiful wife. And if it wasn't for them, I don't know where I'd be. Mark chapter 5. I want to show you something about families. In Mark chapter 5, I, maybe some of you had not seen this before, but the Lord Jesus Christ brings families together. Amen. Mark chapter 5. Look over here at verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him... He fell at his feet, verse 23, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she might be healed, and she shall live. Look at verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years. Remember that. An issue of blood is something that happens to a, a woman back then after she had her baby. She can't stop bleeding. And you're unclean until this thing's fixed up. But a certain woman, which had an issue of blood of 12 years, Verse 29, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Come down to verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, talking to Jairus. Why troublest thou the master any further? Let's go to verse 39. Check this out. And when he was coming, and he was come in, he saith unto them, Why, why, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. Verse 41. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And verse 42. 
And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. Why put that in there? That woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. She had a child. She ain't been home. She's been outside the gates. Why in the world would the Lord put 12 years in the same chapter right there and let you know how long she had that going on and how old the daughter was? He brought this family together. That was, the, that was the mother's daughter right there. Jesus Christ brings families together. The Lord Jesus Christ is my strength. I don't know if anyone else has had this problem in here, but I need strength from the Lord. I have things that come up in my life that get me about once every two weeks. Something, something in, in people's lives they take hold of them. They keep them from reading their Bible and keep them from praying. Some kind of little besetting sin. There's some, something that keeps nagging at you. And this thing you just can't kick. You think you have victory over it. Then about a week and a half goes by and there it is again. That same old thing. Every t I might be the only one that has a problem with this. But the Lord is my strength. And I, I, have, I have figured out that if I pray and seek His face, and walk in the Spirit by His grace, that that thing disappears. It does. He is my strength. He keeps us up. He picks me up when I fall. I bless his holy name. He's my high priest right now. Right now he's up there. He's up there. He, when, the, when the accuser of the brethren is up there accusing me, he says, no, I've already paid for that. Get out of here. And when I pray, he's up there and he takes all the junk out of my prayers and he presents the good stuff to the Father. He's our high priest right now. And he's my Savior. And he keeps me saved. He's the only Savior. He keeps me safe. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 says, For we are kept by the power of God. I can't keep myself safe. You might be good enough to keep yourself safe. I'm not good enough to keep myself safe. And anybody that says you can lose your salvation, you have to keep the commandments, you've got to keep the golden rule, you've got to do this and do that and hold up to the end. I ask them this one thing. Are you good enough to keep yourself safe? It's hard for them to answer that. You just blow your mouth off. I mean, now come on. You're not good enough to keep yourself safe. No one is. You can't do it. He keeps me. Now, what, now what, to what really matters. What does the Bible say about the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what matters. What did God say? He's the creator. Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Oh, now you're getting it. There you go. Now, now you're seeing it. Hebrews 11.3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ framed this universe. And speaking of universe, I hope you know what the word universe means. Una is one. A verse is a spoken sentence. When you look up, you see one spoken sentence. God said, let there be. Atheists are calling it a universe. They don't know what they're talking about. He's a redeemer. He's the only redeemer. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 1, 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. He's our Savior. The Bible says he is the Savior. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. First John 4.14, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And of course, John 14.6, Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is what I want to get to. He will be the king over this world. I've spoken to a lot of good Christians, and they think right now he's reigning as king right now over, over this world. He's my king. I'm not, I'm not, now look, I'm not, he's my king. I love him. I love him. He is not ruling over this world right now. He is not. You have to rightly divide this book. You have to know what's going on. Right now, he is our high priest. When he was here the first time, he was a prophet. He will be a king. When he came the first time, I already got ahead of myself, Acts, Acts 3.22, he was the prophet. Right now he's our high priest according to Hebrews 4.14. He will come again as kings of, king of kings in Revelation 19.16. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. 
It is so important to take what God said and simply believe it literally. If you take this Bible literally, if you believe it literally, unless you have to spiritualize it, if you take it literally, you will get a catching away of the church. You will get a seven-year tribulation period. You will get a thousand-year physical reign on this planet from the Lord Jesus Christ. You will get a, a white throne judgment. You will get seven judgments. If you believe it literally, it's simple. If you spiritualize, if you, if you believe, if, you, if you're omelis, post millennialist, if you don't believe this kind of stuff, three-quarters of the book is a closed book to you. Nowhere in that Bible to told you to, to spiritualize everything in this book. There are some things you have to take spiritually. The Lord Jesus Christ says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. Well, he told us to take that spiritual in the following verses. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are true. He told us to take that spiritually. Now, there's some folks to take that literally. He told he called Herod a fox. And I know Herod wasn't no fox. Okay? There's some things that you have to take, you have to take spiritually. Okay? You're always safe in doing that. Even Satan himself knew his future reign on earth. I'm going to try to explain this thing. He was very, very subtle in trying to get the Lord Jesus Christ to take the kingdoms early. Very subtle. And if you don't watch it, you'll miss it. Please turn to uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse, verse number 1. I want to show you something. Satan is an ancient beast. He's very smart, and he knows the Scripture. He knows what it says. He can read the Scripture. Luke <clears throat> chapter number 4 and verse number 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, Now remember, he's trying to get Jesus to hurry up. The Jesus, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it, might, that it may be made bread. Well, if you look in Revelation 12, Verses 6 and verses 14, he will make food in the future. Satan's trying to get him to hurry up and do the right thing at the wrong time. Verse number 6 in Revelation 12, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. She is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Verse number 4 of Luke 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give to thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whosoever I will. It was delivered unto him by Adam. Adam handed the kingdoms right over to him. Satan is the god of this world. Well, if you look at Revelation eleven fifteen. He will get the kingdoms of this world. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Satan's trying to get the Lord Jesus Christ to do the right thing at the wrong time. If thou therefore, the devil said unto him, Okay, verse number seven, If thou therefore worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. Come down to verse 11. Where is it at? No, verse number 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. God gave his angels charge over the Lord Jesus Christ his whole life. He lived around carpentry. He wouldn't let him shed that blood until he got to the cross or at least to the Garden of Gethsemane. Anywhere he went, the angels would bear him up. He wouldn't even dash his pinky toe against the, the table he was working on. I'd do it once a week against my bed. God wouldn't let him fall. God, would, God wouldn't let him get hurt. Wouldn't let him bleed. Wouldn't let him do anything. So if he was to jump off that temple... I'm talking about the temple in Jerusalem. The angels would have caught him. He would have floated right down. And those Pharisees would have saw that. Malachi 3.1, the Lord shall suddenly come to his temple. 
The Pharisees saw that. He was, a float, he was floating down through there. They had to crown him right there and put him on the throne for the wrong reasons. Satan's smart. He's an ancient beast. These weren't just regular temptations. They're, they're, it's a deep thing in here. And, and, and Satan is trying to get Jesus Christ to reign early for the wrong reasons. He will come and manually, physically, and violently take the kingdoms. Now, I'm going to go through some verses right here. And what I want to do, and I'm almost done here. I, I, I want to go through this thing at the second advent of Jesus Christ. I want to explain, if you believe that, if you take the Bible literal, the things that are going to happen in the order in which they happen. I'm going to back it up with Scripture. I might not be 100% on a couple things, but I, I believe I'm close. And I pray the Lord God will, will only let truth go out these doors. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew. I'm in Revelation 19, 11. Through 21, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, that's us, upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses. We'll get to this. And of them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them, and had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Verse number 20, that lake of fire. This thing's talked about in Isaiah 36, 6 through 10. It's in Bozrah, Edomia, that's south of the Dead Sea. It talks about when a, its stream shall be turned to pitch. And I believe this thing is going to be ignited when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming is going to ignite this area. And the Bible says there in Isaiah that the, the, the smoke of it goes up forever and ever. I believe that there will be a literal lake of fire on this earth during the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. It explains a lot of scriptures. Some people don't like to hear that. They think it's just sitting around the birds singing and trees growing. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule this planet with a rod of iron. Amen. There will be a literal lake of fire, I believe. During this time, if you're angry with your brother, you're going to be in danger of the judgment. During this time, if you feel that you need to call your brother Raka, which I've never had, that's juice. I don't, I've never had an inkling to call somebody Raka. You're going to be in danger of the council. See how this is a Jewish connotation? So you've got to rightly divide this book. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ was offering the kingdom to them, and he would have set it up if they, if they accepted him, but they rejected him. He said there in Matthew 5, 20, that your righteousness had better exceed that of the Pharisees so much that if you as much say, thou fool, thou shalt be in danger of hell fire. That's body and soul thrown in right there. Zechariah 14, 3 through 4. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of the battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a, great, there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain uh, shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Which also, and that's, what that's talking about is Acts chapter 1 verse 11. The Mount of Olives. Which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall show come again in like manner, as you see him going to heaven. He's coming right back on that same spot. Revelation 14, 20. And the wine press was trodden down without the city. That's called the Hidron Valley. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even to the horse bridles. There's a lot of people who say, We're not coming back on horses. Clouds don't have bridles. By the space of 1,600 furlongs, he's going to come up 
to that eastern gate. That has been sealed since 1517. There was a Turk there by the name of Solomon. He sealed it off and built a Muslim cemetery in front of it because he knew the prophecy. And he didn't think that a Jewish holy man would walk over a Muslim cemetery. <laughs> it ain't going to stop the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what it talks about in the Old Testament about that sealed gate. And they haven't been able to open that gate ever since. They've tried. Electrical equipment's gone bad. People's got struck by lightning. You cannot open that eastern gate. Ezekiel 44, 1 through 3. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looked toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened. And no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince. He shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the way of the same. He entered the first time on a donkey. He went through that eastern gate. They laid the palm tree. He said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That same crowd crucified him. It's been shut for a long time. And when he comes up to that gate, he's going to bust it open. I can't wait to see this. This stuff's really going to happen. You know what I mean? I mean, this, this is really going to, and it's going to happen soon. I mean, it's going to happen real soon. I don't think we're going to go past 2030, but you didn't hear that from me. I really don't. I really, <laughs> this thing's going to happen soon. When he comes to the gate, the Jews are going to come up to him. In Zechariah 13, 6, and one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What a sight. What a sight. The Jews are going to have the scales brought back from their eyes like the Apostle Paul was a type of, and they're going to actually see the Lord that they crucified. And they're going to mourn. Zechariah chapter 12, 10. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. It shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Luke 1, 32. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. In Revelation 19, 15, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. It's going to happen. You take this book literally, you believe it, a thousand years, it's going to happen. Nowhere in that Bible did God say take it spiritually. He is not ruling over, his, over this world right now. He will come and he will rule, rule, rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah 65, starting at verse 17, describes this whole time. It talks about that the years of my people shall be the years of a tree again. They're going to live 900-something years again. It says, that the it says that the people will not live in what they don't build. It says they won't eat what they don't grow. It says that a center of 100 years shall be accursed. That's in Isaiah 65, verse, starting at verse 17. People will have 100 years to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their king. That's what I get out of that. And if they don't accept him as their king, they're going to be cursed. And they're going to be part of Gog and Magog, in which when Lucifer comes out of that bottomless pit, he's going to gather, gather them together for one more war. And it's not going to be much of a war. God's going to send fire down from heaven and devour all of them. We ain't going to have to do anything but just shout. That's all we're going to have to do. I know it's a lot of stuff, but I've always wanted to teach and preach on this kind of stuff. I'll get back to Lord Jesus Christ right here. And I'm almost done. Now, the last two are short. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, I know we all know that, but there's a lot of smart alecks out there that says Jesus Christ never claimed himself to be the Son of God. I don't think they read John chapter 9 too well, verses 35 through 38, talking about the man blind from his birth. I mean, these are supposed to be scholars. And a scholar, there ain't no scholars in here. Our pastor's not a scholar. There ain't no scholar. A scholar, you mastered your subject. Ain't, ain't nobody on this planet ever mastered the Bible. There ain't no scholars. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and we had found him. He said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Amen. Last thing I want to mention about what the Word of God says about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. Yep. That's, that's just all there is to it. He said, I don't, I don't understand that. You don't have to understand it. Just believe it. That's what the Bible says. John 1, 1 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, and the Word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us. That's it right there. You can hang your hat on it right there, and that's it. But there's more. 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Acts 20.28, 20, here's a good one. He says, feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That was God's blood ran down that cross. We get our blood from our Father. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't get his blood from his mother. We always get our blood from our Father. Where did it come from? That came from God. So I don't understand that. I don't either. I just believe it. <laughs> Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And one more, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Amen. You say, ah, that verse shouldn't even be in there. Well, they aren't in the new Bibles. None of them. They're gone. They're gone. But they're in my Bible, and that's why, that's why it's the Word of God. I believe it. I believe it. Because it's true. You're a trinity. God's a trinity. He is. Your body, soul, and spirit. You're a, some of you are a father, you're a husband, and you're a worker. We got a father, we got a husband, we got a worker. So I, I just believe it. It's in there, so I believe it. You say, see, with these new Bibles, Origin, Westcott, and Hort, they didn't believe in the Trinity. They didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Lord God Almighty. They didn't believe in the blood atonement. They didn't believe in the second coming. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. They didn't believe in salvation by faith. Look up their beliefs. They are the authors of all these new Bibles. That's why they took it out. It's simple. I said all this to say, I said all that to say this. It doesn't matter what I say about the Lord Jesus Christ. It really doesn't. It, do, it, it doesn't matter. It matters what does this book say and what does God say about him. I don't care what the what talking heads say about him, what CNN says about him, especially Fox News. I don't care what any of them say about him. It's what this book says. It's what the book says. Now, if you don't believe the book, now, if you don't believe that the book in your hand is the Word of God, I don't, I don't blame you for being double-minded or wishy-washy about who Jesus Christ is. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ promised... This book, in Psalms 12, now you all know this verse, Psalms chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. They say we don't have the word of God today. Well, you just called him a liar right there. Yeah, that's right. Okay? We have the word of God, and it's in this book right here. Now, if you don't have the Word of God, I, I, I don't blame you for not knowing who He is. 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul said, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. They were corrupt in Scripture in that day. And you say, well, I was always taught this, and I was, I was always taught that by my teacher, and I, 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 about who Jesus Christ is, and I think God told me this, and I think God told me, well, it doesn't matter what you think you heard or what a teacher told you, whatever you, whatever you think God told you, it doesn't matter. And I'll prove that to you, and I'll be finished right here. It only matters what this book says. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 20. Now listen to this. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice. It is talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter heard that voice from heaven. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now, Peter said, although we heard that, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Where until you do well, that you take heed. What's he talking about? As unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Yeah. This is what he's talking about. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No matter what voice you hear, no matter what you think God said to you, if it doesn't line up with this book, Amen. throw it out. That's all there is to it. Now, to be sure that you're not caught up with this false Jesus that Paul was talking about, be sure you have a Bible. I, and uh, Be sure you have the Word of God. Lay your hand on that book and ask God, just like the preacher said many times. Be sure that, this, that you have a book that you believe. He promised to preserve it. Do you have it? Do you have it? There's so many versions out there. If you get caught up into this stuff, you can, you can get caught up in this false Jesus that's being preached today. It's Jesus that's saying you're okay. And, and, and God loves you. You're just fine. And this Jesus that never mentions sin. And this Jesus that never gets mentioned about the, with the white hair and the, and the eyes flame of fire and the feet is in the brass coming back in judgment on a white horse filling the Kidron Valley full of blood. 
You don't hear about that Jesus. He's not a baby in a manger anymore. He's the Lord from glory. He's going to come back, and he's going to take the kingdoms by force. You can choose to know him now. You can choose to know him later. It will behoove you, if you're watching out there, it will behoove you, that's how you say that word, to know him now. He will be king. If you reject him and wait to see all these things come to pass, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. Get to know the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. He's not a 70-pound hippie pinned to a tree. He's the Lord God Almighty, slain for the sins of the world, smitten by the hand of a holy God. Know him. Know him. He's coming as judge, but right now he can be your Savior. And he can bless you and take care of you. You don't have to worry about a thing. He'll always take care of you. He'll take you to heaven, and he'll be your king. Amen. Thank you for listening to me. I just wanted to lift his name up a little bit, maybe teach you a little something on what I think is going to happen in these last days. Eschatology, like Pastor says, just a big word, study of last things. I like that stuff. I really do. I really do. Right now we need to win some souls. This is good stuff to know, but get out there and tell people about Jesus. All right? I mean, you know. You know. All right, let's pray. I'm done. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the liberty I got to open this book. People are in agreement. We just have good liberty here, God. You're here, and we thank you. Please don't let the candle of Temple Baptist Church flicker out like you're talking about in the book of Revelation. Please keep it lit. Please bless our pastor. Please keep him. Please protect him. Please bring him back. Please refresh him. Please give him a desire in his soul and his spirit to keep putting messages together like a newborn babe and to keep preaching. Give him a love for it, God. Bring him back to us. The sheep need him. The sheep need him, but he needs a break. And I thank you for the vacation and the, and the rest that you've given him. Bless this time now. Glorify your name. Be with us. As we go out to work this week, we're going to need you. We're going to need you going back into the world. We need your spirit with us. Teach us more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Brother, you want to play a song? I appreciate it, brother.